Good to see you this morning. A good group here today. Look like y'all came to have church. I'm excited about today because today we're going to be sharing in the Lord's Supper. And let me just preface this time where we take communion together as a church. That as often as we do this, we do this in remembrance of Jesus. Number two is we do not at Believer's Fellowship practice what some churches do in regards to what is called closed communion. Closed communion means that if you're not a member of a church and you can't participate in the Lord's Supper when that church has the Lord's Supper. Well, we don't do that. Uh, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ personally as your Lord and Savior, then you are welcome to participate when we come to this time of service for the Lord's Supper. To participate in that with us, we'd be glad that you, that you would celebrate that time with us. So it's not closed. Um, we are the ones who uh, really can't disqualify you. Only the Lord can disqualify us from enjoying it this time together. And Jesus said, if you, as you do this, if you remember me. Personally, I don't think we can honestly remember him if our hearts aren't right with him and we're not in tune with him. So uh, let's talk about that a little today because Jesus said in regards to the Lord's Supper, when you do it, it's about me. I want you to remember me. And I think sometimes we don't understand the full uh, thrust of that and what the Lord's actually saying, but I do want us to take the time today to understand what it means. We can spend a lot of time talking about it. In fact, a little bit of what I shared already in the series we just finished dealt with that. We've just finished with Easter last Sunday, the Resurrection Sunday, where I preached on the Resurrection. But five Sundays leading up to that, remember, we dealt with the journey of the cross. And then we began in the upper room where Jesus met with his disciples, and they met together in that upper room. Remember, he washed their feet there. He, they took Passover meal together. And then he took the two elements from the Passover meal of the wine and the bread and presented those to them and instituted at that point what we call the Lord's Supper, Communion. And he took those elements and he talked about them. So we did talk about it just a little bit in that message. But I want to just kind of focus on what it means when the Lord says, as often as you do this, remember me. Because that's the heartbeat of what the Lord's Supper is all about. And so I, I want to take about three points this morning and kind of bring that out a little bit more and, and talk about these facts, these points as significant points and significant facts to help us to remember the Lord as we receive the Lord's Supper today. And at the end of that, we'll... Uh, We'll come to a time of, to receive the Lord's Supper together. But first of all, uh, 1 Corinthians, when Paul is speaking, remember Paul was not there in the upper room. He was, he was appointed as an apostle after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. But he writes to them, he says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And he went in to telling the church at Corinth what the Lord's Supper was all about. And he explained it to him. He says, In the night, you know, that the Lord was betrayed, he took bread and he took the cup. And then he talked about the actual incident that took place as the Lord gave him a revelation of what happened that evening. And then he talked about the significance and the importance of having our hearts right. But the three things I want to bring out of that, first and foremost, is this is a table of commemoration. Commemoration has to do with remembering the past. It's looking back in time and remembering exactly what was going on and what the Lord was doing there. And so as we look back, Jesus says, you do this in remembrance of me. And now we're looking back over the centuries. To that time in the upper room when Jesus was with his disciples and he took the bread and he took the, the cup and he, he shared it with his disciples. And it is a time where we go back and remember exactly what it does and what it was all about and the significance of it. Jesus is there right prior to Gethsemane with the disciples and he's bringing in a very clear picture that he's getting ready to go be crucified and he's going to give his life on the cross and he's going to be judged by sinners. And he's made it very clear to them. And then out of the Passover meal, he takes these elements. Remember, Passover was a, was, it was a meal that celebrated the deliverance of the children of Israel from the captivity of the Egyptians. And it was a celebration of freedom. It was a celebration uh, that they would remember all the Lord had done. And every element on the table, I mean, all the food items, had special significance, all right? And even the Passover meal would begin with one of the children in the family beginning by asking the father of the family, what is the meaning of all this? And then he would take time to go through each specific part of the Passover meal, from the bitter herbs to the lamb to everything there, and explain the miraculous deliverance of the children of Egypt. Well, Jesus has had the Passover. They've gone through the meal just as it was Jewish tradition to do it, and then he takes these elements. For us, as we look back on it, it's unique. They were looking at Passover as, as something in the past as well to commemorate something. But really... They didn't fully understand that that whole Passover was really a symbolic picture of everything that was before them in that moment. It was all about Jesus. It was all about a lamb who would be slain. It was all about a sacrifice for sin, blood being sprinkled on the doorpost, and the death angel coming and taking the firstborn of each home that was, that was not under a blood-sprinkled house. 
And it was all a prophetic picture that, hey, one day there would come a spotless lamb who would give himself up for us. John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So <clears throat> Jesus is in, is in reality what that Passover meal was in figuratively, all right? And what the Egyptians represented by an old life, a life of bondage. Before Christ, that's our life. We're in a life of conflict. We're in a life of bondage. But when we come and we surrender our hearts to Christ, listen, it's like the door has been sprinkled with blood. We, we are not afraid of death anymore. We're, we've been offered life in Christ Jesus. And so we look back in time to the Passover meal where Jesus had it as they celebrate deliverance and then he takes these elements where we look back to it and we celebrate deliverance as well and we realize everything Jesus did for us was symbolized, was, was symbolized in that meal and specifically when he takes the bread and he takes that wine and he lifts it up and he says this is, the, this is my life being given to you and this is the cup of the new covenant in fact you know prior to this time in the temple, at every time this year, a Passover lamb would be submitted. People would bring, every family would bring a lamb up for sacrifice, to represent a sacrifice for their sins. But understand that even though those bulls and lambs and all those sacrifices in the Old Testament were given year after year, they could really never forgive anybody of anybody's sin. Now we know the wages of sin is death. The Bible says that. And that's why there were these sacrifices that took place, to represent a price being paid for sin. But all those could never really pay for your sins. They were just an act of faith that we would trust God to forgive us. We look back to the cross today and celebrate what Jesus did in giving up his blood, a sacrifice for our sins. The prophetic fulfillment of all those old sacrifices was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And we look back to that. They would present their offerings, really, and they're looking forward to a gift that would come, to a sacrifice, to a Messiah that would ultimately come. When Jesus is crucified on the cross, he's representing that sacrifice for our sins. And remember, that's why the veil in the temple was rent, because there wouldn't need to be a holy of holies anymore and a sacrifice made by animals anymore. Because the true sacrifice, Jesus Christ, gave up himself on the cross to pay the price for our sins. That's why when the writer of Hebrews says, it's just not possible for the blood of bulls and goats or lambs to take away our sins. It's pretty powerful words. It's just not possible. And those blood of bulls and goats sacrificed by the millions up to that time in history, when sacrifices would cease, hey, they never were, suffi were, were sufficient enough. They were just symbolic. You see, if the price is going to be paid for sin, <clears throat> first of all, it's our sin, so who should pay the price? We should. But someone came and took our place. His name is Jesus. He stood in for us. The First John, King James Version put it this way. He is the propitiation for our sins, the one who would take our place in sin. So he comes and he dies on the cross. And the blood that is an acceptable sacrifice, the blood of a human, had to be shed. But it had to be a perfect human. Problem one is, there are no perfect humans <laughs> until God becomes a man. And guess what we have now is a perfect human. And he made himself available to pay the price for our sins. So we look back and we celebrate we rejoice. At the same time, our hearts are broken to know that God would love us that much and Jesus would suffer that much for us. But it's a time of commemoration. The second fact I want you to catch this morning is it's not just a time of commemoration, remembering. It's a table of communion. This represents the present, all right? We, when we come and surrender our lives to Christ, anybody that genuinely makes that kind of surrender their heart to Jesus, something happens. The Holy Spirit of God, the Bible tells us, moves in, and we become a new person in Christ, all right? We, we use the term kind of lightly, inviting Jesus into your heart, all right? That's a common term. But the reality is, that's exactly what's happening. Through the person of, of the Holy Spirit, Christ actually comes and inhabits this new temple, all right? This body. The Holy Spirit of God lives in you. And it's a present tense relationship. It's not just something he did in the past or way out in the future, right now. And, and when we talk about communion, it has to do with right here in the present. We fellowship with God. We have a relationship with God. We have this uniqueness in a, because of his presence in us where it's a present tense deal. I, you know, I'm not just looking back over my shoulder. I am celebrating the present. Understand that today Jesus lives. He is risen from the dead. And he wants to be alive in any person who will allow him access into their will, access into their heart, access into their mind where they surrender their selves to him, they become a part of a communion relationship. 
of fellowship. The Greek word is koinonia, that we share, literally the word means to share in a common life. And that common life now is Christ, who's present in us. So there's this, there's this past relationship based up. I have this present relationship based upon what the Lord has done for me and giving up himself, but now I have this present relationship of communion and, and fellowship with him. So there's this living Christ, there's this risen Lord who now lives in us and we have this fellowship with him and we ought to be able to live in such a way that we enjoy that relationship. Over and over the scripture talks about this personal relationship between you and God, but also even talks about the personal relationship between you and every other person who knows him. There's this communion that we share in, there's this life that we share in, there's this fellowship that we share in. But we need to live it, and we need to walk in it, and it needs to be genuine to us. We don't need to forsake what God has done for us. We need to walk in fellowship with him. That's why Paul wrote the church when he's writing this letter in 1 Corinthians. He says, listen, you don't eat and you don't drink unworthily when you come to the Lord's table. You don't eat and you don't drink unworthily because if you do that, you drink a judgment. King James used a little more severe terminology. You drink damnation to yourself because you're not discerning the Lord's body. He goes on to say, so we should judge ourselves so that we're not judged of the Lord. How do you judge yourself? Well, you say, am I walking? Am I enjoying my present tense relationship? Is it all about the past? Well, I don't know what God did for me, but there's no present. You know, a lot of people, you ask them to share a testimony, and they tell you about something God did 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 5 years ago. Uh, in, in my little private circle, I call that stale bread. You know what stale bread is? It's, you know, you, what's God doing today? I mean, tell me what God's done for you this year, at least, all right? Tell me something God's up to your life this month. It shouldn't always be stale bread. There ought to be this present tense relationship where the Lord is manifesting himself in your life and doing something in your life. Because... If there's no present tense activity, that means instead of enjoying his life, you've been in doing your own thing. Doing your own walk, doing your own will, and you've left off the will of God. And you've decided what's more important than the will of God is the will of me, all right? What I want, what I desire, what, what I'm after in life. And this is where Paul warns him. He says, you're taking the Lord's Supper. There's nothing magical about this, by the way, all right? There's no mystery here. There's, no, there's, there's nothing mystical, but it is an act whereby we honor the Lord. We take time to remember what he's done. So we should remember it with hearts that are right. I mean, how would it be if I took my wife some flowers, to, some flowers today? Probably need to. She's, she's fighting bronchitis. Thanks for reminding me of that. Or I'll take, stop on the way home and get some. Anyway, <laughs> thanks, Lord. If I took her some flowers, but I said, oh, you know... <laughs> You know, I got this girlfriend over here. I think I'll stop by her house first. Give her some flowers, too. So I split the bouquet. Yeah, I know what you're thinking, ladies. You think you're going to split me right now. Right? <laughs> but that's what people do when we come to the Lord. We're going to thank the Lord for all he's done for us. But yet we got this other relationship that's more important than him. We've got priorities in our life way above him. He kind of has second, third, fourth, fifth place down the line. He's not important. And what we're not doing is discerning the Lord's body properly, in other words. We're not understanding what's going on. We're not understanding that it's about a rate relationship that is based on my love for him right now. And if I've got a bunch of junk in the trunk, a bunch of junk in my closet of my life, and I'm not willing to surrender those things to God, then I'm, I'm, I'm entering into a dangerous place. All right? And that's why we, even before we receive the Lord's Supper, we give people an opportunity to get it right. To take a moment before the Lord. As David said, Lord, see if there's anything in me that's not right. I, I want to get it right with you. If there's something you've been dealing with me about and I had not been honest with you about it, I want to get it right today. I want to get clean before you. And I've asked people before, I said, why didn't you take the Lord's Supper? They said, well, I wasn't right. My second question is, why didn't you get right? But here's why people don't. Because, and this is the morbidity of humanity. We don't understand grace. You don't understand grace. Grace means that Jesus died for all your sins, present, past, and future, all paid for. So what we do is we get into this relationship with Jesus, but then we fail because we always do, all right? James says we all stumble in many ways, and we think, oh, I better, I better go do something good for God. I've got to work my way back to God. You know, I'll go, it's kind of like, do, I'll do my Hail Marys or something. You know, I'll, I'll go and I'll maybe I'll pass out a track or I'll pray. Give me a couple of days to feel like I'm really worthy now. That, I, that, that, that it's acceptable. Listen, you got the rest of your life, you'll never make yourself acceptable. You could work till you're blue in the face, you're never going to be acceptable. You can give yourself as an offering on the altar yourself, and it's not acceptable. Why? Because it's already been taken care of. 
And when you realize that, I think that gives you a heart to say, then, man, he's, he's done that for me. And I, I don't want to have to be coming back to this thing over and over again. I want to get this right with God. But you can't work yourself back. Anywhere you can work yourself in heaven. The Bible says very clearly, we're saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves, lest any man should boast. In other words, there's no room for pride and arrogance. You just got to say, it's all because of Jesus. The only reason I can take the Lord's Supper, the only reason I can get to heaven, the only reason I can enjoy life, is because of what Christ has done. Because I have nothing in myself to boast of. Now, a lot of us would think, well, look at the Apostle Paul. If anybody could boast, he could boast. But what he say? And he went through this little deal at one point when Philippians, we write, you know, I've done this, this, and this. I'm a, you know, I've, I'm a, the elder of you know, the Sanhedrin. I've done all these things, you know. And to do, just to be a Pharisee alone, you had to memorize the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, books of Moses, by memory. I mean, you tell me y'all can't get past the first two verses of Genesis by memory. <laughs> so if it's left up to you, you're in trouble. But praise God, it's not left up to you. This is the grace of God. This is, this is why Jesus died on the cross. It was horrible. It was suffering. It was terrible. It was miserable. But he did it for you and for me because there really was no way we can do it. So God extends his grace. That's why I'm saying today if there's something not right, you don't have to work yourself back to God because you can't. You don't try to have to prove yourself to God. You can't. This is just God's grace, his love for you so much so. He extends it and he yields himself to you. And you just need to receive the gift of mercy and forgiveness and righteousness that he has for you. You can't earn it. So we understand. That's why Paul says, uh, you know, judge, discern what's going on in your life. Because when you take it, you want to do it with the right heart. So take the opportunity to get your heart right with God. But it's also not just a table of commemoration and, and it's, it's a table of communion, but it's also a table of commitment. It speaks, as we've said, the past, the present, our communion now, but also the future. That the Lord says, I'm not going to do this again with you until we do it together in the kingdom. And then, you know, the scripture tells us how, he, when he, while he's up there in the upper room, that he, he talks to them about heaven, he talks to them about the sacrifices that are going to be made. He even says, I'm going to go prepare a place for you, you know, so where I am, you can be also. So he, he deals with them in this, this Lord's Supper, not only about the past, not about, only about the present, but the fact that there's a future involved. And there's three elements under this. One is, it speaks of our commitment, of his commitment to us. That when, when this surrender of our hearts comes, that not only we talk about so many times that we've made a commitment to Christ, He makes a commitment to us. I love where it says in Scripture, He which began a good work and you will fulfill it until the day of Jesus Christ. If God started something with you, don't worry, He's going to finish it. But what if I blow it? He's going to fix it. What if I blow it big? He's going to fix it big. All right? He is committed to you. Romans says, if it, God gave up His own Son for you, Will he not also give you everything you need in this life? God said, I'm committed to you. I'm going to get you through. You can trust me. And so this, we have this, an understanding. This represents a, obviously a commitment all the way to the future because you take it now, we'll do it again. Wouldn't so, wouldn't tell you. So praise the Lord. We look to the future. But it speaks not only of his commitment to, to us, but there is this element of our commitment to him. You know? That we need to have a walk with God. We need to have a commitment to Christ. We shouldn't be, you know, kind of a quasi-attitude about our relationship to Christ. Jesus ought to be paramount and premier and, and primary in our life. I mean, he ought to be not just number one. He really ought to be like the axle on a, on a wheel. He should be center of our life. So that our life is really just revolving around what he desires for us. And we get serious with him. And we get serious with our walk with him. And it is surprising what he will do in us and through us and with us. That's why when it comes to this point, it says, when you do this and remember to me, do this in a worthy manner. In fact, uh, we talk about a worthy manner. It really says, if we go back to that verse a while ago, it says, take it worthily. You know the difference between adverbs and adjectives, don't you? An adjective describes the taker, which would be me, which would be you today. We'll take this. It, but that's not what it's doing. That's an adjective. An adverb ends with L-Y. Do it worthily, all right? And the L-Y ending means it's talking about the action. The action needs to be done worthily. Because you and I and ourselves and of ourselves, we're not worthy. All right, he's the only one worthy, right? But he gives us his worthiness when we surrender our hearts to him. He makes us right with him. He makes us acceptable in his sight. So that what we do now with the action that we're doing, it is done worthily. What's that really mean? It means that humbly, genuinely, right-hearted, right-minded, right rightly committed, rightly related, so that what I'm doing brings honor and brings glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And I love it when he says, you know, it, it, it talks about our commitment to him. It speaks of really, ultimately, as we said, of his future coming. There's a promise in this. that I will do this again with you. There is a day coming. When we talk about the, the, the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus, don't forget there's another important chapter yet to be done, and that is the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, you believe that stuff? Absolutely. With every fiber of my being, I believe it. I believe with all my heart. I believe with all my mind. I believe there's going to come a moment in time when the Scripture makes it very clear in passage after passage. For every prophecy concerning his first coming, there's two or three more about his second coming, all right? So God says, you can trust me with the first one. I was here. I'm coming again. The Lord is going to come. And the Bible makes it very clear that when he comes, he's going to receive us unto himself so that where he is, we might be also. So he's making this commitment to you. And that ought to be some good news because some of you are looking at your life right now and you're filled with difficulties and trials or struggles and saying, I just don't know if I'm going to make this. You're going to make it. I don't know if I'm going to handle this. You're going to handle it. I don't know if I'm going to get through this. You're going to get through it. Because God has made a promise to you. And you may not always be faithful. Paul said, I have not been faithful, but he has remained faithful. It's his nature, it's his character, his faithfulness, and his commitment to you. And you can trust him today with it. So the idea here, folks, is we're going to take the Lord's Supper. We realize it is a table of commemoration. We're going to remember everything the Lord's done for us. It is a, it is a table of communion. We want to enjoy that relationship right now in the present. It is a table that talks also about commitment. His commitment to us all the way to the end. So as we do it today and as we receive this, let's receive it in a way that will honor the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to stand with your heads bowed for this moment. And what we're going to do is just take a moment before we receive this together. Just get our hearts right, get our minds right. And just say, Lord, if there's something in me, Lord, I want to know. I don't want to, I don't want to carry it. I, I don't want to have things in my heart, my mind, my life that are just not right with you. Just with our heads bowed in this moment. Maybe you, as a Christian, you know things hadn't been right with God. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, that if we will confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Right there, you have a promise from the Lord that he will forgive you and cleanse you. And whether you want to kneel there at your chair or maybe come to this altar this morning and find a place around one of these prayer rails here and just get some things right with God, we're going to take a moment to do that this morning. Just get it right. Maybe you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. There will be some men here in this altar place today who will gladly pray with you share Jesus with you. Just, it really comes down to not some actions of, of uh, rules and steps you go through, folks. It really a surrendered heart. Today, why don't you come, take one of these men by the hand and say, I'm surrendering my life to Jesus today. The greatest thing you'll ever do in all your life is surrender your heart and your life to Jesus Christ. Why don't you do that in this moment in time? Surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. With every head bowed and every heart open to the Lord, I would encourage you today to make very serious this moment in time. Paul gave a great warning. We ought to do it with the right heart. Only God can make the heart right. Would you let him find a place to turn it over to Jesus right now? Maybe surrender your life to Christ, whatever it is today. This is a moment for you to do some business with the Lord. Father, you know our hearts and our lives. Call us to yourself and draw us to yourself today. Would you come just as we worship the Lord? You come. come to lift up this precious baby, Father. We don't do it on the merit of a parent or a child or a person. We just come to thank you for Jesus' sake that you touch us in As I anoint my sister with this oil, I pray you to anoint that baby right now. Right where it's at. I get in the powerful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Cover him with mercy and grace. Father, you tell us by your stripes that we're healed. So as we celebrate, Lord, that day when you were striped for us, 
We ask you, Father, in the name of Jesus, to let those stripes be invoked, Father, the power of those stripes over this baby. And heal, bring grace and deliverance and mercy. Touch those little lungs today and restore them in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Lord, we do lift up Melissa. You touch her life, her body, her heart, and soul. God, do, especially in regard as a mom, to just dismiss worry and doubts and fears. Right? Have a heart of faith and trust to you, Father. And restore, Lord, with anything going on with her physically as well. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you, God. I love you. Just with our heads bowed just for a moment, our ushers are going to make the way to the front while we're praying here. But Father, we come to you today and we do want our hearts to be in tune with you and your will. And that as we would take this, Lord, we do it with pure hearts that we actually understand the great price that you paid for our sins. May you be glorified as we receive this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. It's always an interesting uh, time we come as a church to remember the Lord and the Lord's Supper. In Believer's Fellowship, whenever we take communion, we do it, it's the whole service. It's all about it. Some churches will, you know, put it on the end of the service every week, some once a month, some they have it on a schedule. We try to be really sensitive to the Lord. Uh, we just, I never want to get to a place where it's mundane or routine. I always want a heart that's tender and a heart that really does remember. I mean, the Lord has done so much for us. I mean, we, words cannot describe everything God's done for us. So I want us to have hearts that are pure and tender before Him when we come to it. So that's why we try to give so much focus and attention to the Lord's Supper. In just a moment, we're going to pass these elements out. And I'm going to ask that as we pass an element out to you, each time you'd wait to receive it as we, we give thanks together and take it together. The Bible says in the night that the Lord Jesus was betrayed that He took bread. Scripture says that He took that Passover bread. And the Passover bread, you know, if you go back and study the Old Testament, it had to be prepared in such a fashion, in such a manner... It couldn't be leavened bread. It rep that represented sin in the Old Testament. And it, it, it had to be baked on, on a certain way over the fire so that the literal grill marks would show up on the bread. And then it had to be pierced. And this is, this is Passover bread that we use at the, in the Lord's Supper. It's unleavened. It's been baked appropriately uh, as the Old Testament prescribed for it. And it had to be, it is pierced with holes. Now, hundreds of years before the Lord Jesus Christ was born, it's the Son of God on the planet, all right? He's existed for any time and eternity. Before he became a man, God gave the prescription for the Passover meal to be followed exactly in a certain way. One day in time and eternity, God sent his son who stepped out of heaven, became a man, sat in that upper room, held that piece of bread up that had been prescribed under the law and said, this is my body. Thrown in the furnace, scarred, striped. The Bible says by stripes we're healed, pierced on our behalf. So as you take that bread in just a moment, we'll have a word of prayer over it. And you, you hold on to it. I want you to remember everything that the Lord Jesus Christ has said and everything that it does represent to you today. And just take a time between you and yourself to have a little private worship service where you take the time personally to say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for loving me this way and caring about me in such a fashion that you allow yourself and your body to be offered as a sacrifice for my sins. They'll say, as we pass it out, take it, then wait with the rest of it, and we'll, we'll take it together. The nails in your hands, the nails in your feet, Tell me how much you love me The thorns on your brow They show me how You bore so much shame to love me And when the heavens pass away And all your scars will stay Just how much you love me And I want to say Forever my love Forever my heart Forever my life is yours Forever my love Forever Yours. 
just how much you love me and I want to say forever my love forever my heart forever my life is yours forever my It's amazing that the Lord could take such frail instruments and use them as illustrations. They decay, they rot, <laughs> so quickly. But so does this vessel that God has given us. We're made to live eternally, but to do it in these vessels, they're going to have to be glorified one day. <laughs> your soul's going to live forever. But Jesus took that frail human vessel and presented it as a sacrifice for us without sin. The Bible says he took the bread and he gave thanks. Well, Lord, we want to come to you and give thanks from each of our hearts to honestly say, Lord Jesus, we do remember you. And we take very seriously about what you've done for us. We take this bread today and lift it up as a simple offering to say, Thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving yourself for us. And you be glorified in our lives as we surrender ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, thank you. To you take and eat. Three simple words in the New Testament when Jesus came to the next part of the Passover meal. As he took the cup, he said, in like manner. In like manner. The manner of just that he'd broken the bread with. Then the marvelous thing about that was, the manner was that he knew exactly what he was doing. He knew where he was headed. He knew the trials that were before him. He knew Gethsemane was just hours away. He knew everything that was coming. And the manner in which he took the cup and the bread was the same manner in which he took on human form, that of humility. The Bible says he humbled himself and became a man. So as we take this cup, we should have the same manner that he took it with, that of humility. I'm going to ask you as these gentlemen pass it out to take the cup. Just hold it for a moment. And take a moment between you and the Lord to have a little private worship session to thank him for what this cup represents, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. White as snow, white as snow, though my sins were as scarlet, Lord, I know. Lord, I know I am clean and forgiven through the power of your blood and the wonder of your love through faith in you I know that I can
but the blood. In Gethsemane, Jesus had a different cup before him than what he presented to the disciples. It was the cup of suffering. It's the cup of judgment. And when he looked into that cup, he saw every wicked thing humanity has ever done, every rebellious act of God. Why else would he say, God, if there's any way possible, let this cup pass from me? Every horrific, horrific sin, every terrible thing, every perverse thing was in that cup. Jesus realized that he who knew no sin, as the scripture says, would soon become sin. And he would have to take all that upon himself. But he would become our sin. He'd become my sin. He'd become your sin. And so as you hold what that represents in your hand today, what it represents is not what he had to drink. This represents what takes it all away. This represents cleansing. Not the blood of bulls and goats. This represents the life-giving blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why... It, the cup was offered to the disciples. He took it and he held it up and it says, and he gave thanks. Again, knowing what he's getting ready to go through in like manner. Humility and thanksgiving. Father, we give thanks today. And how can we not if we'll be honest with ourselves? You, the guiltless one, we are the guilty ones. But you took our place and you bore our sin and you paid our price. And Lord, when we receive this cup today, we do so remembering you, Lord Jesus, and thanking you once again for all that you are and all you've done for us. Thank you, Lord. I love you. I praise you. And we drink this in remembrance of you today. As you drink it, just remember him. Thank you, Jesus. I want you to stand with me and let's sing that chorus again, What Can Wash Away My Sins. Can we do that? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. God, you may be seated. Praise the Lord. There is nothing but the blood of Jesus that can wash away our sins. And I pray today you walk out of this place with a sense of revival in your own heart. I really don't think we can take the time to receive the Lord's Supper and not have some sign of revival going on in our heart and life and thankfulness for what God has done for us. Amen. 
A uh, couple of things, just very quickly. One, if you're a first-time guest of ours today, I'll be out in the lobby with some other of our leadership team. We'd love to meet you personally. Just take that, uh, that form Tim was talking about in the bulletin, that inside form that talks about connection card. Fill that out, bring it back. I'd like to put something in your hands, and uh, as you put that in my hand, just to thank you for being a part of our worship service today and enjoying your time with us. I will hope that the Lord tests your life. Also, don't forget your tithes and offerings. There are receptacles at the offerings door. We don't pass a plate. There are three wooden boxes, one at each exit. You can place your gifts in there as you come or as you go and honor the Lord with your tithes and your offerings. Uh, before we go into any final announcements, there's something that's, uh, uh, that we want to share with you as church. Pastor Tim Ellis is going to share with you first, and uh, I want you to come, Tim, right now. You got the handheld mic there? Is it turned on? Something to share with y'all, and y'all know how it's kind of Turn it on, there now? You got it. How emotional I can be, and I just uh, kind of put this in a letter form um, to share with you so that I could just read it to you, um, or try to, um, but uh, it's addressed to Dear Brother Joe and Church Family. Um, it is with great sorrow and regret that I'm writing this letter. Words cannot express the prayer and emotion and tears that have gone into my decision. But effective May 1st, I'll be resigning from the church in the interest of my family and personal health reasons. I am sorry for any letdown or pain or inconvenience this may cause you or your family. Please be um, assured that it has um, nothing to do with the church or the staff of Believers Fellowship. I also want to assure you there is no hidden sin in my life. Um, that has been found out or anything I'm running from or running to, just to make that clear and leave Amen. no room for whispers. Amen. The past 18 years of my life have been some of the best. They've all been spent in ministry and Believer's Fellowship for the glory of God and Savior. Um, in the past 18 years, I've seen hundreds of youth and young people come to know the Lord. I've seen dozens who have grown up and gone on to glorify God in their own ministries and youth ministries. I've also had the privilege of seeing thousands of souls, one on the mission field, with each of you right by my side. As of May 1st, I will be stepping down to a part-time position and will continue in that position through the Belize mission trip. June 15th will be my last official day. I am very uh, aware of the frustration and disappointment that this may cause you and your families, and I want to take this opportunity to apologize for that. This was both unforeseen and unplanned, but now as it draws near, I believe that it is the Lord's timing. Please know that my heart and passion is for God, for this church, and for missions and for your families. My family and I will not be leaving the church. This is our church home. We look forward to many years of ministry with you and your families. I do not know what the future holds for me or for Believers Fellowship, but I know we can lean on the same promise of Philippians 1.6. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. I thank you for your understanding in these matters, and may God continue to bless you, our families, and the ministry of Believers Fellowship. Thanks. Amen. Amen. I'll go ahead and praise the Lord for Tim just for a second, would you? Amen. You may be seated. This is just as hard for me, I think, as for Tim in some ways, because he's uh, my, my son in the ministry, my Timothy. <laughs> and in many ways, he was already involved in ministry when he came to Believer's Fellowship off the mission field. A lot of you know his testimony in his life. And he has put in a uh, few years part-time, rest 15-plus full-time years of serving the body of, of, of Believer's Fellowship. And his testimony has been so profound and so strong and so sure and just been a steady ship all the way. And there's so many people that have come and gone in ministry since then, you know. And I, 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 some of you know are aware of Tim's situation, the blood pressure issues that keep spiking, all those things. And uh, we even talked about him changing roles in ministry a couple of years ago because he felt like maybe the youth ministry thing is, he said he was getting old. I hadn't seen it yet, you know. It still looks the same as it is. He had hair back when he first came. But, uh, you know, but uh, he really feels like this is the Lord. He asked me a while ago, he said, when do you want me to read that letter? I said, I don't. So... <laughs> But uh, I'm standing with him, and I know you are, and you pray for him. He will be through the continuing a few more weeks of full-time ministry, and then he is going to go into a part-time mode 
uh, all the way through the mission trip, and then we'll figure out what we can get for, out of him for free after that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love you, Tim. Praise the Lord. Amen. So praise the Lord. Y'all just continue to pray for Tim, especially in regards to some of those health issues that have been going through with blood pressure problems and things, and they keep giving him all kinds of stuff and double mixes of stuff and things, and so it's probably me. <laughs> Don't you dare say amen. <laughs> but uh, I love you, brother. Praying for you. God, God's going to give you direction and wisdom as we go. And as he will all of us, praise the Lord. We'll just take it a page at a time as the Lord always leads us through it anyway. Praise the Lord. Uh, you'll get a chance to fellowship with Tim around dinner back here. I'm sure everybody's staying for lunch, right? Amen. Amen. All right, Brother Tim. <laughs>